Richard Emmett, the Program Director of the Blue Ridge Music Center, and I'd like to welcome you to our discussion series, Deep Roots, Many Voices. This series is part of a project by the Blue Ridge Music Center, exploring diversity and inclusion in roots-based music. In this discussion series, we pair two musicians in each episode to talk about issues related to race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation, how these issues have been part of their personal stories, and the importance of celebrating diversity in the music world. These discussions highlight contributions to American roots-based music from the many voices that make up our nation and give us hope for a rich and diverse musical future. The series was coordinated and conceived by Blue Ridge Music Center Associate Director Marianne Kovach, who also moderates these discussions. I hope you enjoy the series. Thank you for joining us. And now here's Marianne to introduce you to our guests. Hello, and welcome to Deep Roots Many Voices. I'm Marianne Kovach, the Associate Program Director for the Blue Ridge Music Center. Today I'm speaking with Sam Gleaves and Joe Troop. Sam is a multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, performer, and instructor, and is also director of the Berea College Bluegrass Ensemble. I first met Sam when he was a teenager just learning to play, and I've seen him grow as a musician, singing, writing songs, and performing as a solo artist. Also a musician, singer, and songwriter, Joe is known for his multicultural approach to music. He speaks Spanish and Japanese and has lived all over the world, most recently in Argentina. I first met Joe in 2017 when he and his band, Che Appalachia, traveled from Argentina to Southwest Virginia as part of their first U.S. tour. Since the pandemic, Joe has returned to the U.S. to live. He's been writing songs of social justice and performing with the band, the Joe Troop Trio. In this conversation, Sam and Joe talk about issues facing musicians who identify as LGBTQ and how their own sexual identity has informed their songwriting and performing. Here they are, Sam Gleaves and Joe Troop. All across this country from the east to the west, everywhere I go I find the same old mess. Good hearted people doing the best they can with a mucked up system that don't give a damn. But I'll My name is Joe Troop. Thanks, guys. It's great to be on with you. Um, I'm from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I have, I guess, lived 14 years of my adult life outside of the United States, two in Spain, two in Japan, and then a whopping decade in Argentina, um, all the while with my five-string banjo and fiddle. And uh, just, I decided to be a musician and have worn many hats through the years in order to do that. So I'm now in Durham, North Carolina, and uh, glad to be talking with y'all. My name is Sam Gleaves. I grew up, I was born and raised in Withville, Virginia, and I came to Berea College about 10 years ago as a student, and I loved the community and the, the music scene here so much that I've, I've stayed here, and now I teach at Berea College. So I'm here in Berea, Kentucky today. So I guess one of my first questions is really, how did you get involved in music, uh, both learning to play, who maybe inspired you early on, and how you made that transition to not just playing, but to getting on stage and playing? So, um, Well, I grew up playing piano, you know, not that seriously, but I was into it. I was, in, I was, I was always into music and, and singing and you know, singing in church, uh, singing at school, doing musicals in elementary school and middle school. And just, you know, just in, I was, I was definitely interested in the arts, but, uh, my older brother had a particular influence in my life. He was, you know, he was in love with music too. And we were always, you know, just fooling around, having fun playing with 
keyboards and stuff. Um, then he, you know, he's a bit older than me. He was a uh, student at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. And he came to pick me up to spend the weekend with him. Um, and on the way, he noticed this little diner on the side of the road. And he said, oh, this this will be cool. Joe, you'll like this. Because he was at ASU and he'd heard about bluegrass and and old time and, you know, string band music from Appalachia. But it, it happened to be uh, Doc Watson playing with some of his friends and family oh. in this little tiny diner in Deep Gap. And uh, I was completely transfixed. And that was the moment that kind of sealed the deal. I was like, that's that's me. I, I want to I wanna play string instruments, switch between different string instruments and singing songs and i had never seen anything like that so that that was that was how i got uh i guess initiated um into the fold as they say and then uh i was able to study banjo um in quick succession in winston-salem there's a lot of great banjo players that i got to um you know take lessons from craig smith jody king um there were tons of festivals in the in the area so as a teenager i was able to start going to you know fiddler's grove and galax uh you know bass mountain bluegrass festival was ever whatever was close to winston-salem i just zipped up and zipped back and to me at the time it was the a huge adventure you know so i got uh that was my first um foray into you know what they call i guess musical culture whatever that means. Uh, we can go back to what culture means later, but so I, I, uh, I ended up just kind of identifying completely with that. And of course, as a teenager, I was, I was playing a ton, you know, hours and hours and hours a day, just totally obsessed. And, uh, that, that's just, that's how I got my start basically. Joe, I'm hearing so many parallels in your story and mine. Uh, I also, was really lucky to grow up in a family that was supportive of me wanting to learn about music. And so my grandmother's a piano player and she plays clarinet and sings and she directed the children's choir in her church and uh, chimes and did a lot of music in her church and still does. And so she was always encouraging me to sing and uh, I'm sure that some of the first singing I heard or did was with my grandmother and she has been a tremendous encouragement to me my whole life and so my dad offered me this opportunity to take piano lessons and I did that for a couple of years but I was resistant to learning to read music and the rigors of that kind of study and which is a funny thing to think about now because I am so interested in, in learning to read and broadening uh, musical horizons. But I quit piano lessons and I got a guitar when I was 12 or 13 and just totally fell in love with folk music. Uh, and I was listening to people like, you know, Bob Dylan and Joan Baez from the folk artists uh, in their heyday in the 60s. And then I would read that they their music was influenced by music from southwestern Virginia, where I was born and raised and grew up. I, you know, I didn't know about the Carter family until my dad took me to the Carter family fold in uh, Scott County to hear music, and that's also how I started to fall in love with old time and bluegrass music was being at festivals and hearing people sing songs. I remember being a school kid and uh, we took a field trip and somebody sang Barbara Allen for us in an old barn on a field trip, you know, and I was enthralled with that. Um, so it's amazing how you can grow up in Appalachia and not necessarily hear old time music unless you want to seek it out um, or unless you're in a situation where you're able to seek it out. Um, so I was really fortunate when I was in middle school, I think. I got so interested in guitar that my mom said, well, would you like to maybe try to find someone to teach guitar lessons? There's a fellow in rural retreat that teaches, and that was Jim Lloyd, and he still teaches in his barber shop there in rural retreat, Virginia. And when I walked in the barber shop, 
for my first lesson, that was really the first time I had seen up close and personal um, three people playing an old time fiddle tune. It was four kid deer and the claw hammer banjo and a fiddle and Jim playing the guitar. And I thought this is really captivating. This is magical, you know, to hear the the wildness and the the energy of an old time fiddle tune. And I was just hooked. Jim was really generous uh, in teaching me to play guitar and banjo and uh, got me started on fiddle and other instruments. I was always one of these people that wanted to play a bunch of different stringed instruments. And uh, I love the different ways that they accompany the voice, the different instruments. So I've kind of a jack of all trades and master of none in terms of playing instruments. But uh, then I went to Berea College and I joined the Berea College Bluegrass Ensemble, which is directed by Al White. And he was a really important mentor and friend to me. And that was my first experience being in a touring band and got me hooked on that. Uh, and I've been excited about traveling and sharing Appalachian music ever since. And throughout that whole time, I've um, been writing songs about my experiences or working class stories from Appalachia, that sort of thing. I was just going to say one thing that I find interesting about both of you is that um, while you're you're both uh, out gay men, you are also very open about it in your songwriting and when you're uh, performing. They're just wondering how that has affected you and also how, um, you know, if it was a tough decision to start writing songs that really uh, kind of focused on this area. Hmm. Well, I, I started writing music a little bit... Uh, Later, well, later, years after coming out, I came out as a teenager, um, of course, as a white boy from North Carolina, it, it's kind of like coming out was a, a thing you did. I, I, I later came to learn that in all different kinds of cultures, different socioeconomic backgrounds throughout the world, some people do the whole gay parade differently. There's a, there's a lot of ways to peel an onion, and there's a lot of cultures in the world, and there's a lot of, you know... Just, humanity is incredibly vast but at 19 i was like well i need to make some sort of public declaration because i was losing my mind and uh so i did and it was you know that that was a huge weight off you know relief but it was also an annoyance actually because i quite frankly i i didn't even realize it fully at the time but you know white like waspy north american culture is uh, very judgmental and, and uh, there's a lack of solidarity in general within our culture of cohesiveness and belonging there's a judgment and a pushing out and an expulsion element of this society that I haven't found uh, elsewhere so at like 19 I came out I had the gay parade I kind of like I had to get out I just left at that point so I went to Spain as an exchange student and found this wonderful community of immigrants uh, from South America. And those are the people that uh, kind of pulled me into their arts and culture world. And I, and I found a lot of healing in that process because I, I, was, um, I was separated for the first time geographically and just mentally from Puritanism. Puritanism, this idea of basically being a pure human being. Like I was suddenly in an arts environment with people who were like, there's no such thing as purity. That whole belief system is stupid. I'm like, yes, thank you. I needed to hear that because I, I knew that intellectually. I had suspected that, but I'm, you know, the solidarity that I feel like I have isn't necessarily coming from the bluegrass community or from white America at all. It's something I've been able to cultivate within myself because of love and learning about uh you know a, a different set of values from people outside of this region so um that that's given me strength i feel like i i can now come back and say well this is my proverbial cross to bear as they say i should say it because maybe the little joey troops out there that are still teenagers <laughs> need to hear this thing voiced in fact sam interestingly enough at, at berea college i said some of this stuff on stage 
talked openly about my sexuality, a line of all the gay kids were like, oh my God, thank you. It was like, it was like oh, of course they feel identified with that. And not enough people do it publicly. But again, Puritanism, Puritan culture shames you. They censor you. You're not supposed, no, we don't, like, I don't, but I just, I don't have any contact with that, thankfully. I just show up. And since I'm in this package, I'm presented with the opportunities to be a talking head for white people. And I, and I love to poke the bear because that bear needs a poking. <laughs> Beautifully said, Joe. Absolutely. I was in the audience when you performed at Berea College and you really did change the space in the room when you came out to the audience. And in the way that you did it was you know, to show that we have community, that we can look around and see each other and see who's smiling when you, when you come out and, and feel that community. And I was lucky that I had community with other queer people when I was young. I was so fortunate in that a lot of my friends were involved in theater or or music or uh, visual art, that sort of thing. In high school, we had a great group of arts teachers at my high school, you know, who were up against it and didn't get the resources and the support that they deserved from the school system, but they were creating safe spaces for queer kids in their classrooms and in their presence. And so we were able to be out to each other and our peers, you know, I was out to my peers and my friends in high school and then and out to them and some of my teachers before I came out to my mother and father. Uh, so, and I was so lucky that when I came out to my mother and father, they were affirming and loving. And, you know, of course we have things that we don't understand about each other that we work through like all families do. But uh, my family have been overwhelmingly supportive and loving and I'm grateful for that every day. Um, so, I mean, and I had so much privilege in so many ways. Uh, I was, I didn't have to go around being afraid of being assaulted and attacked. I mean, although those fears do come, I think to all queer people at one time or another, or that reality comes to a, a lot of queer people, which is really sad and something that I hope we can work, you know, to end, but I I felt like also in the music community, I was able to be out in some ways and not able to be out in some ways. And I still navigate this. I think a lot of people who play bluegrass and old time music still do navigate this issue. A lot of my mentors knew that I was gay before I came out to them. I, a lot of them I didn't ever have to come out to. They just knew me and saw me and supported me. Um, but then some of my mentors who were older and from a more fundamentalist Christian background, I'm not really out to them. You know, we, we may not talk about that, that part of my life and I may know them through music and our relationship may be based on music and that my sexuality may not come up, you know, or they might meet partners of mine and never ask, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of complicated situations and, uh, I also grew up going to Fiddler's Conventions, like Joe was talking about, uh, you know, and it's disheartening to walk around those Fiddler's Conventions and see Confederate flags and all kinds of uh, hate speech on stickers and people's clothing and all of that. And so in one way, I felt like I could run around and be free. I remember joking with some friends of mine who were also openly gay old time musicians like we're gonna put the gay back in gay lax we're just gonna run around this fillers convention and have a good time and you know if that people don't like it they can go somewhere else you know but then on the other hand there are some situations at those fillers conventions that made me fearful and and other people too and you don't it's not like you look around in our old time scene and see a lot of black trans women playing old time you know because there's still a lot of problems in terms of welcoming diversity, truly. Um, and it's very complicated because there is also a place of genuine love and acceptance in the old time music community in a lot of ways. So it's very complicated. 
going back to as a teenager, your I was in a theater department too, uh, very active in the theater, and all of us were gay. I mean, it was very clear, uh, gay or we're going to be trans or we were the queer kids. I mean, it was fairly obvious, but we weren't out yet. Cause this was, again, I I'm thinking maybe there's a five year span. I don't know how old you are, but I'm, uh, I'm 38. I'm just curious. What oh was. yeah. I'm 29. Okay. There was a huge change that happened between the late nineties and the mid two thousands, as far as gay acceptance, like when the, there were all of a sudden, uh, in mass media, there was more of a, a humanization that happened. But I think I, I call it the trail end of the AIDS era where there was just like, you know, ugh, these, mm. and then it started, it was starting, starting to lighten up a little bit. So I think we would have all been out together uh, in that experience, but still even no, knowing we were all gay, we never vocalized that as teenagers, which is really interesting. Well, maybe some of, some of them did. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and ask my friends. Hey, did, you, did we? Did we knew we were gay, right? Did we? Did anyone talk about that? And uh, <laughs> I remember some of the kids coming back after they'd been at college for a semester, being like, "I'm gay," and blah blah blah. You have to accept me. And I'm like, I still can't say this out loud. I'm still in high school, man. I can't. I can't come. I can't do this. Uh, it would have been social suicide. I mean, back then, I remember there were two gay kids in my whole high school that were out uh very brave um they had support webs in their family that i didn't have too so you know a lot of times when children come out they, they have an acceptance factor behind them but uh anyway um i just think that you know there's it, it's nice to go back in back in time and remember where you fall in history and, and uh i was surprised uh coming back to the states you know I came back for a stem between 2007 and 2009, and there was a huge change. Of course, I was older, so I was out of my childhood, you know, uh, sphere. But nonetheless, I felt like, oh, and now there's this very it was very common all of a sudden to have a GSA at a public high school, uh, like things that had, were barely starting to percolate in the late 90s, early 2000s. So. I don't know. I don't think I was going anywhere particularly with that thought, but if anyone wants to. Well, just, I think that we could talk about these experiences and the, um, and the history that we're addressing all day, you know, but I, I am so grateful for all the people, the queer people in the last hundred years or more that have steadily created the space that I'm able to be in right now. Um, I, f I feel that gratitude all the time. And I think, um, you know, during the pandemic, I was uh, living in Hyman, Kentucky. And, uh, you know, when the lockdown happened, I felt really isolated from other queer people in a lot of ways. And so I listened to this whole podcast called Making Gay History, which I think yeah, is I really good. I do too. Yes, yes. So um, I, I do hearing all of those stories about how hard people had to fight to survive and thrive and uh, defend each other, really build a community has reminded me of how privileged I am to live in the time that I do and to be in this body. Uh, and I, people have commended me for being out in my life and my performing. And I think that praise is not for me. It is honestly for all of the people that that came before. So I, f I feel that too, Joe. Absolutely, and and you, I I guess you know, like me, no one that you really associate with gives a damn about your sexuality. It's not a big deal in in your in your intimate sphere in your friend group. So having that, you know, uh, readily available is huge. Uh, highly encourage people to get that if they don't have that, because there are tons of people out there who will accept you. I mean. You've just got to leave the knuckleheads behind. Sometimes you have to you have to leave people behind in life. That's that's just the way it goes. And I have no problem with that because a lot of people aren't worth your time when they have these deep seated prejudices. That ain't your battle to pick. You got to work on yourself, healing. But uh, yeah. Um, there are so many instances I think in living in in Appalachia and playing Appalachian music in our music community. 
we would lose a lot if, say, say if I decided, you know, I'm not going to sing uh, any music anymore that's associated with uh, Christianity because it's been a, a problematic institution that's caused a lot of people a lot of pain or, you know, um, because also, you know, I've known so many um, Christians on the whole spectrum from fundamentalist to, to very liberal um, who are wonderful people and just want to take care of their communities and love people. You know, that they're about the example of Jesus and loving people and, you know, um, service and all that, those sort of things. So I'm, I've had a lot of uh, soul searching and questions for myself about, oh my gosh, am I really going to get up and sing this uh, apocalyptic song, you know, uh, from, you know, these scriptures that I, it's not, I don't want to sit down and read those scriptures and all of that you know it's just uh but the music has a power to bring people together and you can connect with people who are very different from you and i think that's the really important work like what joe was describing you know if you sit down in a fiddler's convention and you're willing to listen and be be gentle in a way and to acknowledge that we're all coming from a different perspective and we can still enjoy playing music together even if we don't have the same political yeah. orientation or you know back you know there's there's a lot of potential in music for healing and yeah. for connecting across divides um not that we should ignore those divides or not that we shouldn't work to create justice in the world i mean i certainly believe we should but i think maybe part of how we do that is by genuinely listening to people that are different from us, you know, which is hard to do, hard for me and hard for everyone. I'd like to bring it back to uh, some like your songwriting and things uh, related to that. You know, if you could both talk a little bit about some of your songwriting and how, um, you know, what, how you've covered topics related to queer people. I was so fortunate when I was at Berea College to work with Silas House, who became a dear friend and mentor of mine. And he encouraged me to write about my own experience and to find stories that resonated with me in some way and to write about them. So he, uh, in a class that he taught called Contemporary Issues in Appalachia, he put a beautiful article on his desk on our desk that was written by his partner Jason Howard who's a great creative nonfiction writer and journalist and it was about a coal miner from southern West Virginia named Sam Hall and he was suing the coal company that he worked for because he had been discriminated against as an a gay man working in the mines he was outed and his fellow workers um, threatened his life uh, insulted him. There were many uh, terrible things that happened. And so Sam Hall reported that behavior to the coal companies and they would just move him to a different mine and uh, try to ignore it. And he eventually filed a lawsuit and won a settlement from the coal company. But what was inspiring to me is that he spoke out about his experience. And he was one of the first working class gay voices from Central Appalachia that I saw represented in the uh, national media. And I was very inspired by his story. And so I wrote a song from his perspective called Ain't We Brothers. And I started to sing that song in public. I was pretty audacious and I don't know that this was really a responsible thing to do in retrospect because I wrote it from his perspective he's the lyrical I home beside you thought I heard some whisper sound got found out word got around got made out for something I'm not called everything but a child of God didn't mind to show it out in the parking lot uh, and I didn't get in, I mean, I tried to contact him immediately, but I didn't 
get in touch with him. It was like five or six years went by before I actually connected with him. He welcomed me to visit him and his partner, Burley, and he was very, very gracious and kind and sharing his story with me personally as well and saying that he identified with the song I've got a man waiting on me at home to tell you the truth I don't want to fight I just want to say one thing I'll write to you ain't we flesh and blood all through Anyway, I've, I've started to feel like every time I sang that song that I was coming out to the audience. And it was sort of a way that I could come out. And I was introducing this and saying, this is someone else's story that I've written. But he has the same first name that I do. And he, uh, you know, there are some similar elements in our experiences. And I started to feel really nervous sometimes when I was going to feel like I had to come out to an audience. If I looked out at the audience and thought, okay, this doesn't look like a, you know, I mean, visually, you know, sometimes you step out on stage and you, you see faces and you wonder, you know, where the, where is everyone coming from? You know, am I going to be able to reach people if I come out in uh, a song, you know? And I started wearing a rainbow banjo strap when I was in college as well and started to sing some of the traditional songs from with pronouns that I identified with, you know, just started singing a love song. If I was going to sing a love song, I would just sing it with he, him pronouns the way that I felt it. And I learned a lot of music from women musicians um, in the tradition, like Maybell Carter, or, you know, so many others. So um, all of that was happening, but one real inspiration uh, that I've had, I've had the privilege of knowing the women in Real World String Band who have been recording and performing, uh, sharing their music in all kinds of settings, activist settings and general concerts and on picket lines and all kinds of places in their 40 plus years of performing. And they're based here in Kentucky, uh, probably the first all queer woman string band but they didn't promote themselves that way. They were just real world string band and they just cared about Appalachian music, wanted to write songs about social environmental issues that affected women and working class people and the Appalachian environment. And so I've really admired their approach over the years of, you know, putting the the stories and the issues into the air in beautiful songs and not, I feel like they had a, a a subtle and responsible way of presenting uh, issues and songs, and I've tried to to emulate that. That's awesome. Yeah, you have to know who your audience is too. I mean, if they're playing in the hills and hollows of Appalachia, they have to, you know, if they they want to measure the efficacy of what they're doing. And that's important to do too. Like in every context, I'm not going to be as much of a rabble rouser because sometimes that's le less effective. I do, I do enjoy having my perspective. I feel like I'm entitled to my perspective. Um, and that can also, that can often come off as if I had a chip on my shoulder, which I do. I have a chip on my shoulder about how gay men are treated and admonished and you know and quite frankly a lot of time like you were just talking about the, your reticence to come out to an audience why do you have that well because they don't like you because you aren't accepted and you know that because you're a gay man and i'm a gay man too i know this and i you get gross looks you get quizzical looks you have people say are you sure i mean maybe you're just confused i'm like i'm almost 40 years old are you talking about confusion check my grinder account there ain't no confusion but, you know, like, I, I will say that it's, as a songwriter, Purdy Little Rainbows was my way of taking this bluegrass lexicon 
this music that I, I know all these bluegrass songs, great songs, by the way, the American songbook is chock full of wonderful music. So, and I, there's nothing better than singing about a little groundhog or something. I love animals. So I love the animal songs like, you know, roosters and groundhogs. Uh, so in pretty little rainbows, uh, I kind of talk about the little groundhogs waddling to and fro under the trapper's watchful eye and singing, you know, you know, letting their pretty little rain- rainbows shine from atop tall bridges and through the heart of all religions. Well, this is one for all the Appalachian queers out there, all the little pretty rainbows. But really, the, the song, I, I, I wanted to write that for the little pretty little rainbows shining in dark places like the two cent queers and pork chop queens this is a song to celebrate the views and use we've got that good old not the san francisco fried. some like it gays not like to fried. like them a bacon pancake you because know, i mean the rain takes it takes different the converging the forces in order to push a movement forward uh, but there are a lot of people that are in the trenches, you know, that are in places where their sexuality, their sexual identity is not an asset. In fact, it's very uh, controversial. And those people are brave. They stick it out. And those are the pretty little rainbows. So I wanted to write that song for them. It was kind of cathartic. Also, using that language is is fun. I love, I love some of the bluegrass language. Uh, I, 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 this Appalachian English is, is, is interesting in how you can, you know, kind of, uh, it, it combines like a level of humility and, uh, and grace with a very powerful message sometimes. And I, I do, I do glean that out of this tradition. I really want my songs to sound like there's a thread in there of, some kind of Appalachian essence that it might make someone think, you know, I, I, I choose to, some songs I write on guitar, but I choose to play them on the banjo because the, the tones, uh, speak of the place where I'm from, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, the, the, the moments that have meant the most to me that have impacted me the most have been hearing artists talk about, intersectionality in their in in who they are and expressing that in their art and so uh, that's why I have tremendous admiration for you Joe and respect for you and your work because I hear the the many intersections of your identity in your music in a way that you can convey your wholeness through your music and that's a uh, and that inspires other people. I hope to do the same, and that's what that's what I want to do in my work. Also, is you know, coming out is not some on stage is not so much about me as it is saying you know, I'm a gay man, working class person from Appalachia, and I love old time music. And you can be all those things and celebrate yourself. Um, you know, all the all the things that each person in the, in the audience brings. You know, I, um, that that's what I think is the goal. And I think that I, idea came to me through people associated with the Highlander Center in East Tennessee. And uh, that, awesome. yes, yes. So uh, anyway, I'll, I'll turn it back to Marianne and see where we should go next. So I'm working on... Uh, some writing about LGBTQ plus musicians from Appalachia or LGBTQ plus musicians who play Appalachian music. And so I just wanted to say to, to both of you and, and anyone that sees this eventually, that if you know of an artist that you think that I uh, should learn about, I would love to hear uh, because so much of LGBTQ plus history in Appalachia has been hidden and coded and uh, 
it's it's a lot of detective work that it, it takes to uh, find out. You know, some people are. You know, I, I'm very thankful and grateful for the the Joe Troops of the world. You know, and uh, Amethyst Kia, and you know, so many others that are out and open. But there are so many musicians who are navigating that in different ways and are not as public. So. Anyway, I'm just, I'm interested in continuing these conversations. Yeah, I, I don't really have um, much to say other than I'm moving to Durham, North Carolina, and I'm going to really be digging in into being a local, uh, which is in stark contrast to how I've lived most of my life, which is like just continent jumping and constant travel. Not that I'm not going to do that, but I, I want to be... Uh, more focused on the work that I can do in North Carolina for this next this next period of time. So, if anyone has any use for me in the world, which somehow <laughs> happened today, thank you, Marianne. <laughs> I'm here, and you know I like to talk. So, hit me up and go visit Sam at Berea College because Berea College was uh, I I got to figure out how to get back there too, Sam. I'll just go ahead and tell you. I love that place. I couldn't. I can't believe that um, that there's actually a school in the United States of all places like that. I was just like totally blown away. Well, thank you. You're always welcome to come, and let's make a reason. Let's let's make it happen. Totally. All right. Well, just thank thank both of you. Um, we're uh, glad that you're able to participate in our our series here, the Deep Roots Many Voices, and uh, we're glad to talk to you. So thank you. It was a lot of fun, y'all. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Marianne. I, that's one thing that I want to say, absolutely, is thank you for holding this space and for the work that you and your team are doing to create this documentary project, which I'm excited to see and honored to be part of. So thank you very much, Marianne. All right. See you later. A pulse is a heartbeat. By this we are united, we will love one another, we refuse to be divided. In our hurting and our grieving, we will strive to understand that a pulse is a heartbeat, feel it in my hand. Though we may be different, and in justice raging round, we can reach toward compassion in each action, thought, and sound. Though the hate can be unraveled when we work and when we pray, our hope will not be silent. We will voice it every day. A pulse is a heartbeat, by this we are united. We will love one another, we refuse to be divided. In our hurting and our grieving, we will strive to understand that a pulse is a heartbeat, feel it in my hand. As we shoulder heavy sadness, and it pains us to the bone. We must draw close together, let no one feel alone. We will nurture understanding for the ones we've lost too soon. We will never stop rebuilding, generations moving through. A pulse is a heartbeat, by this we are united. We will love one another, we read.